Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of James Arthur Ray? Ray was featured in a documentary titled, Enlighten Us, The Rise and Fall of James Arthur Ray. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of James Arthur Ray. I'll move to the timeline of the crime. Then I'll offer my analysis. James Arthur Ray was born in Honolulu, Hawaii on November 22, 1957. His father was in the Navy in Hawaii, but after being discharged, the family moved to Iowa, then to Tulsa, Oklahoma. His father was a Protestant minister in downtown Tulsa. His mother worked from home. As I go through some of the early experiences of Ray, it is important to note that many of the details come from Ray's writings. Some have accused Ray of having a poor relationship with the truth. Growing up in Oklahoma, Ray would listen to his father's sermons. The passage in the Bible about a camel having an easier time moving through the eye of a needle than a rich man entering the kingdom of God really struck Ray as unfair. His parents were hardworking, yet they did not have a lot of money. They didn't even have their own house. Rather, they lived next to the church. Ray developed his own belief system inspired by this outlook. One of his beliefs is that it's a sin to be poor. Ray was ridiculed when he was young because he was not athletic, he wore thick glasses, and he had buck teeth. He graduated from high school in 1976. He went on to earn an associate's degree from a community college in the area. He became quite focused on his physical appearance. His regular workouts included lifting weights. He bought a motorcycle, but he was soon in an accident. When he was recovering from his injuries from that accident, he came to the conclusion that bodybuilding was a distraction from his mind, which he believed was the real source of his problems. He married when he was 26 years old. Two years later, the couple would divorce. He started working as a telemarketer for AT&T, eventually moving up into a supervisory or management position. He claimed he worked with Stephen Covey's company for four years. Covey was the writer of the self-help book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Covey's company denies that Ray ever worked for them. Later, Ray would say that he never claimed to be an actual employee. Ray's time with AT&T and whatever else he did convinced him that he should be in business for himself. He started a company called Quantum Consulting Group. He moved to San Diego and changed the company's name to Ray Transformation Technologies and then changed it again to James Ray and Associates. He mostly was keynote speaking. Multi-level marketers really liked him. For example, he spent a lot of time in front of Amway affiliates. He referred to the seminars he presented as the science of success although they actually involved no science and not much success either, so that name wasn't really a good fit. Another company claimed to have trademarked that phrase, so Ray discontinued using it. From 1996 to 2006, Ray was having trouble financially. He claimed that he started to go on a spiritual journey. In May of 2005, he found himself at the summit of Mount Sinai. He was on top of the mountain holding a small candle and shivering from the cold, when it all came together for him. It's interesting because Moses received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Ray suggested that when this epiphany occurred, he then integrated quantum physics into his new belief system. In July 2005, he was recorded by an Australian television producer named Rhonda Byrne as part of an unpaid project, meaning Ray didn't get paid for it. Her project went on to become a book and film titled The Secret, which came out in 2006. Essentially, the secret is nothing more than the law of attraction, which I'll talk about in the analysis. The deception would have been a more accurate title than the secret. Ray's inclusion in the secret led him to be on Oprah Winfrey, which in turn led him to achieving massive popularity very rapidly. After the secret, we see that the spiritual component was much more pronounced in Ray's belief system. With his new belief system, religion, or whatever it was in place, Ray used his newfound popularity 
to stage a number of seminars. He included physical challenges in many of the seminars, like asking people to fast, walk on glass, walk on fire, avoid sleep, bend rebar with their throats, break boards and pieces of concrete with their hands, and sit in a sweat lodge. A few people were hurt in these adventures, like one woman shattered her hand trying to break a board. In 2008, his company, which was now called James Ray International, made $9.4 million. He had this whole system worked out, like levels that people would obtain in his belief system. The levels are expressed in the shape of a pyramid, like from the term pyramid scheme. At the bottom of the pyramid was the harmonic wealth level. As one moved up the levels, they would go through creating absolute wealth, quantum leap, practical mysticism, modern magic, and finally reach the top of the pyramid with spiritual warrior. In October 2009, at a retreat center in Sedona, Arizona, Ray held a five-day retreat for that top level, spiritual warrior. People paid $9,695 to attend. Many of them were skipping right from the harmonic wealth level to the spiritual warrior level. So this was an opportunity to bypass all those levels in the middle of the pyramid. What better way to move out of that wealth level than paying Ray almost $10,000? It gets rid of that wealth right away. The participants were told the experience would be unpleasant and challenging. A number of services were available at the retreat, including vortex healing, dolphin energy healing, and soul retrieval. They probably just reviewed how to install the Find My Soul app. The participants were advised to fast for 36 hours in preparation for a vision quest exercise in the sweat lodge. The sweat lodge experience was supposed to resemble a symbolic death and rebirth. As the participants were fasting, they were left in the desert with a sleeping bag. At one point, Ray made ponchos available for $250 each. They would enter the sweat lodge on October 8, 2009, at about 2.30 p.m. after eating a light breakfast. The structure was like a large circular tent that was low to the ground. It was about 24 feet wide and four and a half feet tall. About 50 participants were told to cram into the structure. There wasn't much room to move. The temperature in the sweat lodge was never measured. Estimates range from around 150 degrees all the way up to 200 degrees. So it was exceedingly hot at the high temperature in that tent. Ray told the participants they could leave at any time, but also encouraged them to stay strong, to stay in the tent, to remain there, and this would help them achieve some type of breakthrough. The participants were in there for several hours conducting exercises guided by Ray when people started to exhibit clear signs of distress due to the heat. At one point, a woman started breathing irregularly. This was brought to the attention of Ray. He said, we will deal with it after the next round. So these exercises occurred in rounds that would last so many minutes. As a result of the heat, two participants died, and a third one would die nine days later after being transported to the hospital. Eighteen other participants were hospitalized for a variety of problems, including hyperthermia, respiratory distress, dehydration, kidney failure, and burns. In addition to paramedics and other rescue workers arriving at the scene, the police arrived. Ray was nowhere to be found. He would later claim that he left the scene because he was scared and advised to do so by an attorney. A homicide investigation was initiated. Ray was arrested on February 3, 2010, and charged with manslaughter and negligent homicide. After a trial in May and June of 2011, Ray was convicted on three counts of negligent homicide, but he was found not guilty of manslaughter. Essentially, what this is saying is that the jury believed that Ray should have known what he was doing was dangerous, but he didn't actually know. Manslaughter would be where he knew his behavior was dangerous, and he did it anyway. So manslaughter is reckless, and negligent homicide is negligent. Negligent homicide is a less serious offense than manslaughter, but they are both felonies. In November of 2011, Ray was sentenced to two years in prison. I was thinking that he could have given seminars in prison instead of unlock your inner self. He just had to change the word self to sell. It would have been a big hit. Ray would be released on July 12, 2013. He soon relaunched his self-help business. Despite having caused the deaths of three people 
and being a convicted felon, Ray was very much in demand. Now moving to my analysis. Before I get into his belief system, I want to briefly cover the trial. There are a variety of beliefs and feelings regarding the outcome. Some people believe that Ray was actually guilty of manslaughter and should have gone to prison for much longer. Others believe that he should have never been prosecuted for any crime. It was only a civil matter. The participants were intelligent, well-educated people who should have known better than to enter that tent or remain in the tent. Here's how I look at it. Ray was the leader of that group. People trusted him, even though they should not have. They paid him to be there, so they were expecting some type of care, some type of service that was responsibly delivered. He said he had carried out the exercise many times before, which was true, although there were some problems that occurred before, but no one had died. He told them beforehand, you are not going to die. You might think you are, but you are not going to die. So he really set this expectation that death was not going to occur and essentially was saying, when warning signs occur, don't worry about it. And there were many warning signs, of course, before those individuals died. On top of all this, as I mentioned, he had everybody wait when one victim was in clear distress. So he slowed down the care that could have come to that victim. I didn't see this as a manslaughter case, but I think the verdict of negligent homicide was fair. Instead of two years in prison, I think six years would have been more reasonable. I also think a long period of probation should have been required that stipulated no more self-help businesses for Ray. Ray doing that type of work is not safe for the public. So now moving to a description of Ray's belief system. Essentially, his belief system is based on what is referred to as the law of attraction. This theory says that thoughts are pure energy. Positive thoughts attract positivity, and negative thoughts attract negativity. As part of this, Ray adds in what is referred to as the new thought belief. That is, the positive thinking, in addition to attracting positivity, also heals physical health problems. The quantum physics piece comes in due to the ostensible role of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in his belief system. Essentially, Ray just made up something that's sort of like a religion. Some would call it a cult. There is no basis for the idea that positive thoughts attract positivity. Now, Ray can believe anything that he wants. He can teach anything that he wants as well. But he shouldn't claim that it's based on any type of science. Science has nothing to do with his belief system. The next area I want to talk about is the application of his belief system. In the documentary I mentioned before, Enlighten Us, we see a few examples of how shallow and simplistic Ray's intervention tactics are. Really, these tactics are pretty much the same for all self-professed New Age spiritual gurus. These people who claim they can teach people to will their way to success, fame, and happiness. Essentially, what Ray does is this. When talking to like an audience member at a seminar or whatever, he picks out one thing they said to focus on. He tries to find an angle pertinent to that item so he can essentially create a soundbite like a short statement that, in theory, is wise. In reality, of course, it's usually nonsensical and simplistic. Sometimes it's not even relevant to the person's actual problem. So essentially, he shines a spotlight on some aspect of the participant, their relationship with their mother or father, their unwillingness to believe Ray, their lack of confidence, their fear, their anxiety. He will deliver the soundbite in reference to that. For example, one participant said his mother died two years ago. Ray said, is your mother still alive? Suggesting that the influence of the participant's mother is still affecting him. Like Ray thought that was clever. After a statement like this, Ray moves on as if he has revealed something incredible. As if his insight should astound the audience. Amazingly, the audience is usually totally enamored with Ray. They take easy to please. To a new level. Another tactic we see with Ray is consistent with this theory that all success would be possible if not for some unknown obstacle. It's rarely about growth, education, or insight. Rather, it's about this obstacle that's in the way of success. If people could only face this obstacle, whatever it is, like fear or lack of confidence, if they could just get by it, they would have millions of dollars and all the happiness they could ever want. Ray's encouragement 
those statements that he repeats, all these things he says, are nonspecific. He doesn't actually tell anybody how to be wealthy. He speaks in these generic platitudes. Which brings me to the question, why do people believe all this stuff? How come these New Age spiritual and motivational gurus have become so popular? There are a few reasons. Everybody carries pain. Going to mental health counseling is an effective way to deal with it, but it's a lot of work, and often the counselor is going to tell the client something the client doesn't necessarily want to hear, something they know is true, but again, they don't want to hear it. Going to see a New Age guru is more expensive, but the person doesn't actually have to face the pain. So it's a good trade-off in the eyes of some people. The gurus claim that they encourage people to face the pain, but they really encourage them to avoid the pain, to focus on the positive and not the negative. When the participant only focuses on the positive, they start coming under the effects of confirmation bias. They have adjusted their attention to only notice positive outcomes. So if they're only looking at the positive outcomes, then it appears as though the advice of the guru has been successful. One problem, of course, is that now they're in a worse position because they can't see negative consequences on the road in front of them. This leaves them vulnerable. Another reason these gurus are successful is because of the cult mentality. Essentially, people like Ray have created a materialistic religion. His seminars are like church services. People attend for a sense of community, a sense of well-being. They want encouragement. Many multi-level marketing companies know this dynamic well and exploit it to their advantage. Moving to the last item I will cover, did James Arthur Ray show remorse for his crimes? I don't think that he did. Here are three examples of why I doubt him. First, when answering a question about the homicides, he said it had to happen because it was the only way I could experience and learn and grow through the things that I've done. He went on to say, I chose to see it as a test of character, as a test through fire, and I think I did okay. Second, even though he said, I am responsible, he then made two excuses of why he really wasn't responsible. He noted the victims were consenting adults, and his conviction was unusual. So he was suggesting that the prosecution pursued him when they would not normally have. Third, when listening to Ray talk about the negligent homicides, it's always about how it affected him. For example, when talking about October 8, 2009, he said, my entire life collapsed in 15 minutes. It doesn't seem like it was ever about the victims. Or perhaps a better way to put it would be, he thought of himself as a victim, so it was always about just one victim. The truth is that spiritual gurus never want to face reality. They are in the business of reframing the past, to fit their distorted belief system. It's one of the reasons they are so dangerous. What lessons can be learned from this case of James Arthur Ray? No one should underestimate the dangers of spiritual gurus. It is their certainty that is so worrisome. They invoke science to reinforce this idea that they have figured out the meaning of life, when really what they figured out is how to separate people from their money. To be fair, they're brilliant in that endeavor. The only true lesson that these self-appointed gurus teach is never listen to spiritual and motivational gurus. Those are my thoughts on James Arthur Ray. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be enlightening. Thanks for watching.